what I've got here is the harness that we made for this particular swap. Uh, this is set up for a 90 CRX. The C101 plug interface with the with the RSX harness. Hey, keep it down. Quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. I'm sorry. This interfaces with the engine harness. This is the E-plug for the ECU. All these wires actually go back and connect into different connectors on the original ECU plugs. This is the air fuel sensor relay. We're gonna be utilizing the stock main relay on this particular car. Sometimes I'll actually put in two relays instead of using the stock main relay. These two plugs interface with the car's harness. This is responsible for a lot of the powers, starter wire, coil power, a bunch of sensor powers, also the low oil pressure and temperature, water, and things like that. And this is backup lights and fan control. I will put together a little wiring diagram to kind of show how this harness was made. So if you're interested in making one yourself, you can certainly do that. It's not particularly hard, it just requires sitting down and plumbing from one place to the other. These plugs, right here are all for the old engine harness. We do need some power from some of these plugs and backup lights and things like that. But what I'd like to do is take them, peel them all back and tuck them back in underneath the dash so we can get kind of a, a better looking engine bay. That way we don't have a lot of extra stuff going on. Otherwise, what we, what we have to do is we have to take our sub harness, we have to pull it out through the firewall and connect out here. I think it's just much easier to just tuck all that inside there. This one right here, that has power for our injectors. So we're gonna need, and there's probably something else in there we need as well. But, so we're gonna try and tuck this one back in there as well. And if you notice right here, this is the injector resistor box. This is used with an SI or HF as a stock. This is no longer used, this is gonna come right out of here. The harness back through the firewall, we just needed to extend actually only two wires. I know this part might seem like the harness part of the swap. Did you get that? Did you catch that? But it's really not that difficult. You know, it looks like a big mess once you take the loom off. But when you really start breaking it down and looking at what you need to do, it's not really difficult as long as you're working one wire at a time if you're not experienced. So ultimately what we're trying to do is tuck the stuff in that we need to get inside the bay. And then there's, a, there's parts that we need to keep outside of the bay and that's this is the headlight harness to run it correctly we're going to run it underneath all these other wires so that it doesn't fold back up on itself and get tangled in there and that's kind of going to keep the harness not bunched up and bubbled really nice and smooth transition so we're going to kind of tuck them underneath all this other wire so that we can get it routed backwards like, like the rest of this stuff you see here we're working on the driver side we're going to run this section of the harness we're going to run it back through the inside. This on the inside will we'll then connect. But to do that, we're gonna deep pin these plugs, run it in through this, the grommet here, so that it goes back in through the firewall and it'll be really clean install. Uh, I just kinda unbolted the master to kinda get it up out of the way to little, uh, make it a little bit easier to get to. And it's just as simple as just bolting it back on. All right, we finished up the wiring in the bay like we wanted to. Initially, we were going to keep the fuse box up here but I went a little crazy and we just started tucking all the stuff inside the inside the car uh, which is fine because race car and at least it's a little bit more clean up here so this is now going to be mounted inside the car so, but because there's no heater core there's not a blower motor there's going to be plenty of room on just on the other side of the firewall so come take a look at what we did already so by deep pinning most of the plugs we were able to just kind of reroute all the pins back through this the rubber grommet without having to cut it open so it came out really clean who knows if he wants to use this on the street ever in the future. I mean, it is a race car, but say he gets a wild hair up and he lives in San Diego. Maybe he wants his, um, you know, his wipers to work. I'm not quite sure, but if he doesn't, it's just as simple as taking that stuff out. We actually kept the lighting wires in the same stock location. Come take a look over here. See, we just reloomed them. Uh, we took everything out and extended what we needed to. All the stuff will kind of stay up here. Most of this stuff, uh, actually goes underneath the bumper. You're not going to see it. So it'll be a pretty clean spot. On our last 
budget swap. We used the DC Sports uh, budget case swap header. It was about as good a price as any. Prices ranging from about $320 up to about $350. Uh, this time we decided to try a little bit different one. This time we have the K-Tuned swap header. This was something that they were working on as we were coming out with that last swap. So let's, let's check it out, see what it's like. Here we go. This one is stainless steel. It's not polished, but hey, that doesn't really matter. It's budgeted. Now my understanding is it makes really good horsepower, so I can't wait to get it on the car and test it out for sure. But if you're looking for a slightly less expensive version, these run about $259 uh, retail, which means you can probably find them for a little bit less than that if you go uh, hunt around on the interwebs a little bit. Installing this engine in, we had to take our uh, brake proportioning valve and swing it from this frame rail over to the back of the firewall, and that kind of occupied the position where the fuel filter was. We're going to still run the stock fuel filter because, of course, budget. Uh, so we're going to have to remount it. What we're going to do is we're going to mount it up here a little bit higher than it uh, was sitting before. Uh, this is our fuel line. It'll mount in the standard location. We're not going to have to change that at all. Uh, we've got some decent clearance to the header. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this fuel line and rather than have it come pass out here, we're going to pass it straight off the side. And then right over here, we are going to mount our AEM fuel pressure regulator. That will go right here. We'll use this mount bolt right here, make a little bracket, stick that puppy right there. The next thing we'll do is we'll actually make a fuel line that runs forward and comes and connects to this quick disconnect here as well. The fuel return line will come out here and go down to our fuel return line, which is underneath the uh, brake booster. So we got our fuel regulator on its little standoff. I think I'd need to do a little more trimming to make it fit a little bit better. Just gonna bolt right here. Put our fuel line right there. Once we do that, we'll run a few lines. I think you were talking about doing it like this, though. Oh, well, that's right. You're absolutely right. Something like that. Sorry. My bad. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to mount it from underneath. Just like that. So here's our budget fuel line setup. What we've done is, uh, the only thing we didn't scrimp on was the regulator. We found an AM regulator used, that was nice. Don't want to get a non-name brand regulator, you want something that's pretty good. Last thing you want it to do is malfunction and lean out your engine. The other thing is, we bought some fittings to go with it. We bought, from a company called Race Flux, we bought these uh, O-ring on barb and 5 16th barb fittings. They were, I think about $7.90 a piece, I believe. The other thing we bought was these banjo fittings in order to attach right here. Now what I could have done is actually strip the old hose off the stock one. And usually I do that, honestly, but I wanted to try these out and see how they worked out. They're actually really nice. These were about eight bucks a piece. Found them on eBay. I'll uh, put a link to them in the article on the VTech Academy website so you can uh, see where I bought them. They come with copper crush washers and a nice little piece, inexpensive as all get out. And then of course we used high pressure fuel line. Now you have to get a special fuel line for fuel injection systems. It needs to be able to withstand the pressure. And in our particular case we used 5 16 was perfect for our barb fittings. It also was perfect for the return line as you can see right here as we attach it to the stock return line. It's, that's a little bit larger than EG or EK, so we needed the 560s line to go on that. Fuel line was about, I think about $4.50 a foot. So this was a pretty cheap fuel system if you compare it to some of the braided lines that are out there. Granted, the braided lines look really nice. There's some really beautiful kits that are pre-made for some of the cars. 
Although nobody makes one for the EF. Anyway, that's what we did our, for our budget fuel system. Brian's got a really cool battery box that he built for the Odyssey PC680. This is a smaller motorcycle style battery. We're gonna actually mount it here in the, the driver's side fender well. So we just gotta remove some stuff that we're not gonna be using on this car anymore, which would be the factory bumper hanger. He actually wants one of our my three-piece front ends, which you guys will see in a later episode. To get this off, looks like we're gonna have to take the headlight out, which is is a bolt-off affair, so it's not that big of a deal. I didn't know. Oh, there was two. Of course. That one have to be chased. That one probably needs to be chased. So the bracket's gonna bolt to factory holes here to the bumper support, and then. Two back here, which we're gonna add nut certs to. So we're gonna like mark these, and then behind them, we're gonna be the nut certs using the nut cert tool. This, this bracket was something you already had made, right? Yeah, I made this uh, for the Pink's car back. Yeah, I don't know what a 2000. 2006. Early. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, but as you can tell, it's kind of rusty. Uh, we just kind of threw it together and put it on the car. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make up a bunch of them. I'll clean it up a little bit, and make them fresh. So what are guys normally doing when they're doing these swaps for their batteries? Like what have you seen most commonly? Most commonly they just move to the back of the car. Yeah. Because what winds up happening is there's not a lot of room up front, so you really do have to use a small battery. Some of the road racing guys are using small batteries. Sometimes they'll mount them up here, you know, or up. You can actually mount it right here, but that kind of interferes with your cold air intake. Sure. You want to do that. So. Like a B series, you can get away with that, you know, yeah. but there's a lot more room. But yeah, you got an alternator and all kinds of stuff going on over there. Right. So, yeah, you can't really mount it over here. So, it usually almost always has to mount them on the side over here. But by far, the most common thing to do is just throw it in the back. Yeah. But that causes a problem with the, with like a charge, right? You're sending power all the way from the back to the front and maybe I think even starting. the big deal is you have to run a kill switch yeah. almost at any track if you've got your battery in the back. Plus it needs to be in a box. By putting it up here, you eliminate those types of issues. Sure. Um, if you're a drag car, you want it up front anyway because you want all your weight up front. Uh, we could probably make one that held a full size battery if we wanted to yeah. and get even more weight up here, but this works well. We have some cable here to make our starter. This is a little bit on the light side for actually hooking it up to the starter, but as long as you're not cranking for a long period of time, it should be fine. It is the ideal size though to run from our battery all the way back to our fuse box, which moved to inside the car. So we are gonna make this reach all the way back there. I got a question for you. Sure. Do you wanna try and run it up the frame rail, or you want to try and run it underneath the car and in, or how do you want to do that? Well, that's a good question. And I guess that might depend on how we're going to run the wiring harness into the bay, too. Well, we're going to bring the we wiring harness in through that opening right there. Yeah, we can this go through there. Bay. Yeah, we can go through there. Yeah. We should probably get a rubber seal for it, though. Sure. But we could definitely go through there. We'll just run it across and bring it along with this cable and then just bring it through there. Well, let's just say in that case, I don't know, would mounting the battery that over that way then? Be making mounting the battery what? Mounting the battery over there then? Like this part over there? Uh, I would, I can make one that's backwards of that and it could mount it over here. We can make one for the right side. Yeah. The only reason I say keep it like the way it is because the engine's on this side. Oh, I see. Well, I guess the driver's on that the driver's side. The driver's on that side, so it's still So we can put it over here. Yeah. We'll make because one. Because essentially, the program can just bend everything backwards. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I'd make it left or right-handed, and then we can just do it. So, yeah, yeah no problem. Because what we'll do is the starters will just run the starter wire through here and up to the starter. And the alternator, same thing. We'll run the alternator down. And we can yeah, run it back. Super short. Short. So that'd make it super short. And that'd make it pretty clean. Yeah. So let's do it that way. All right. Cool.